Welcome to this lecture. We'll discuss how to choose the most appropriate statistical test for our study. The selection between the statistical tests depends on your question, the scale of your data, assumptions for parametric tests, the experimental design, and the number of groups. To choose an appropriate statistical test, we must first decide if you like to compare, for example, the difference between two groups, or if you want to investigate if there is a relationship between two variables. For example, if we like to compare two different fertilizers for plant growth, where our aim is to see if there is a difference in the growth between the plants in the two groups. Another example could be if we like to test if there is a difference in blood pressure of the same individuals before and after exercise. If you instead like to investigate if there is a relationship between, for example, two variables, we will use other types of statistical tests. For example, if we like to test if there is a relationship between blood pressure and body mass index, we could measure the blood pressure and body mass index of a number of people to see if there is a relationship between these two variables. Another example could be if we like to analyze if there is a relationship between the height of plants and the amount of fertilizer used per week. After we have decided whether we like to test if there is a difference between two or more groups, or if we like to analyze if there is a relationship between two variables, we must then determine the scale of our measured variables. Remember that continuous variables are numeric and are usually measured with some sort of instrument. Examples of variables on continuous scale are body weight, height of plants, concentration of toxic metals, blood pressure, and temperature. Ordinal scale consists of categories that can be ordered in a natural way, such as good, bad, or best, the grades A to F, pain score between 1 and 10, and the disease states mild, moderate, and severe. If the categories cannot be ordered, the variable has a numeral scale. For example, the species A, B, and C are on numinal scale, as well as the colors blue, red, orange, and green. And the variable gender is also on numinal scale, where we have the categories men and women. If our measured variables are on a continuous scale, we can analyze if the data fulfill assumptions for a parametric test. Parametric tests rely on a certain distribution, and for our basic tests, this is the normal distribution. Since parametric tests generally have a higher statistical power than non-parametric tests, we should select a parametric test if we fulfill the assumption of normality, and select a non-parametric test only if we do not fulfill that assumption. If our measured variable appears to be normally distributed, we can be quite confident that we fulfill the normality assumption. From the lecture about the center limit theorem, we know that we fulfill the assumption of normality even for small samples as long as the data is fairly symmetric. If the distribution is skewed, we need a larger sample size, generally bigger than 30, to fulfill the assumption of normality. However, if the distribution is highly skewed, the non parametric tests generally have a greater power because they are more robust against extreme values. In that case, a non-parametric test is generally more appropriate even though the sample size is large. Also, if most of our data points appear to be normally distributed, but where extreme values are observed further away, such as in this example where two data points are very far away from the rest of the points, a non-parametric test is a better alternative because parametric tests are very sensitive to extreme values. Therefore, if we cannot remove the extreme values from the data, the more robust non-parametric tests are usually a better alternative than their parametric tests. In conclusion, if the data appears to be fairly normal, use a parametric test. If the data is skewed and the sample size is less than 30, or highly skewed, or include extreme values that cannot be removed, use the more robust non-parametric tests. Once we have determined if the assumptions for a parametric test are satisfied or not, the next step 
is to select if our study design is paired or unpaired. For example, if we randomly assign five plants to receive fertilizer A and five plants to receive fertilizer B, the plants in the two groups are independent. This is one example of an independent or an unpaired study design. A similar example of an unpaired study design is when we randomly assign individuals into a treatment group and a control group. The treatment in this example is a new drug that is supposed to reduce the systolic blood pressure. Due to chance, person number 1, 3, 7 and 8 were placed in a drug treatment group, whereas person number 2, 4, 5 and 6 were placed in the control group. The individuals in the control group will not receive the drug. In this case, the two groups are independent and we therefore have an unpaired study design. Another strategy could be to pair the individuals based on their current weight and gender. These numbers represent the body weight of the eight individuals before the treatment. We have four men and four women. For example, we could pair person number one and eight who have a similar weight and are both men and pair person number 2 and 4 who are both women with about the same weight. And then we pair person number 3 and 6. And finally, we pair the last two women. We could then randomly assign which persons in the pair we should get the drug treatment. After some time, we check the difference in the systolic blood pressure between the pairs. The advantage of this study design is that we reduce the variability since we look at the difference between similar individuals. This is one example of a paired study design. Another common type of a paired study design is the so-called before and after studies. For example, we could measure the systolic blood pressure of all eight individuals before taking the drug, and then measure the systolic blood pressure again on the same individuals after a certain time since the start of the drug treatment. This is another example of a paired or repeated measured study design. Another example of a paired study design is when we analyze the effect of treated and untreated samples extracted from the same individuals. For example, let's say that we collect blood samples from three different individuals. We then split the blood into two different wells on a culture plate. Then we add, for example, a drug to only one of the wells, so that we use the other well as a control to compare with. After some time, we might analyze cell survival between the two different wells. Since the cells in the two different wells come from the same person, we could think of this as a pair. This is therefore considered as a paired study design. Based on our previous examples, we now know the difference between a paired and an unpaired study design. Suppose we like to compare the difference between, for example, before and after treatment where the variable has been measured on a continuous scale. If we fulfill the assumption on normality, we could choose a pair t-test. Let's say that we have collected data on the same individuals before the treatment and after two and four weeks of treatment. We then have more than two measurements on the same individual. We could then use a repeated measures ANOVA. If we instead have an unpaired study design, we could select an unpaired t-test if we like to compare two independent groups. Note that an unpaired t-test is also called an independent samples t-test. If we like to compare more than two groups, a one-way ANOVA could be used. In the case where we do not fulfill the normality assumption, or when we have extreme values that cannot be removed, or if our measured variable has an ordinary scale, a non-parametric test is more appropriate. If we have a pair study design, or for example two measurements on the same subject, we can select the Wilcoxon sign rank test if the data is on continuous scale and where the differences have a symmetric distribution. If the data is on ordinal scale, or if the continuous data is not symmetric, we could then choose the sign test. If we, for example, have more than two measurements on the same subject, we could use the Friedman test, which can be seen as the corresponding non-parametric alternative to the repeated measures ANOVA. In the case where we used an unpaired study design, 
when we do not fulfill assumption or normality, or when we have extreme values, or when our measured variable is an ordinal scale. We could select the Wilcoxon Man Whitney test, also called the Man Whitney U test, which is the corresponding non parametric test to the unpaired T test. If we have more than two independent groups, we can use the Kruskal Wallis test, which is the corresponding non parametric test to the one way ANOVA. Let's say that we would like to compare the difference between two proportions of two groups where the data is on nominal scale. For example, we could compare the proportions of infected and uninfected plants between two different treatments. If the study design is unpaired, we can either use the chi-square test of homogeneity or the two proportion set test. If we instead like to investigate if there is a relationship between the two variables smoking and lung cancer, we will also use the chi-square test with the same calculations. However, the chi-square test in this example is then called the chi-square test of independence. Fisher's test can be used as an alternative to the chi-square test if one or more cells in a continuity table has an expected frequency that is less than 5. If we instead have a paired study design, we can use McNamara's test. Cochrane's Q-test can be seen as an extension on the McNamara's test if there are more than two treatments. Remember that the chi-square test, in comparison to the two-proportion set test, can be applied on more than two categories. If we like to analyze if there is a relationship between two continuous variables, for example between blood pressure and body mass index, we could use the Pearson correlation if we fulfill its assumptions. By computing the Pearson correlation, we will estimate how strong the correlation is between the two variables. If we instead would like to, for example, predict the blood pressure given a certain body mass index, or estimate how much the body mass index affects the blood pressure, we could use linear regression. In comparison to the correlation analysis, linear regression requires that you determine which of the two variables that should be the dependent variable, which is the one you would like to predict. In the case where we do not fulfill the assumptions for the Pearson correlation, we can instead use the Spearman correlation. Also, if one or both variables have an ordinary scale, the Spearman correlation can be used. For example, we can test if there is a correlation between blood pressure and different age groups. Note that the x-axis in this example has an ordinary scale, where the data points can only have five possible x-coordinates. Finally, we have a look at tests that can be used if we only have one sample. For example, let's say that we have measured the systolic blood pressure of eight individuals. The mean systolic blood pressure of these eight individuals is 123.5. If we like to compare if this blood pressure differs from the population mean or hypothesized mean, we can use a one sample test. If our data is on continuous scale, and if we fulfill the assumption of normality, we can use the one sample t-test. However, if our data does not fulfill the assumption of normality, or if the data has an only scale, we can use the one sample Wilcoxon sign rank test or the sign test. If we like to compare a sample proportion against some hypothesized proportion, we can use a one proportion set test. Or if we like to compare if an observed frequency distribution differs from a known or hypothesized distribution, we can use the chi square goodness of fit test. Remember that the chi square goodness of fit test can be used on more than two categories, whereas the one proportion set test is used for only two categories. We'll now have a look at some simple examples of how to choose an appropriate statistical test. Let's say that we'd like to know if there is a difference in the concentration of white blood cells between healthy individuals and individuals with a certain disease. Our aim is to compare the concentration between the two groups. We know that the white blood cell concentration is on continuous scale and that the study design is unpaired since the individuals in the two groups have not been paired. Note that it is impossible to randomly assign 
who should be in the healthy group and who should be in the disease group out of the 10 participants. Given that the assumptions for the unpaired t-test are fulfilled, the most appropriate test to select for this example would be an unpaired t-test, also called an independent samples t-test. In the following example, one would like to test the effect of a certain fertilizer for the growth of plants. Since the plants are of different sizes, one decides to pair the plants according to their condition and size. One of the plants in the pairs is then given the fertilizer. The effect of the fertilizer is determined based on a number of factors that is summarized in a scale from 1 to 10. In this case, we like to compare the difference between untreated and treated plants. We have used a pair study design. A number of measures of the growth of the plants have been combined into a scale from 1 to 10, where 1 represents no growth and 10 represents maximum growth. We therefore have an ordinal scale. Since our measured variable is an ordinal scale and the study design is paired, we use a sign test because Wilcoxon sign rank test requires a continuous scale. In this example, one would like to compare the weight of a certain fish species in three different lakes. In this case, we like to compare the difference in weight, which is on continuous scale, between three groups. The fish in the three different lakes are independent. If we fulfill the assumptions, we could in this case use a one-way ANOVA to test if there is a difference in the mean weights of the fish between the three different lakes. If we do not fulfill the assumptions, we could consider using the classical wallace test. Suppose we like to test if there is a relationship or an association between smoking and lung cancer. The two variables are a numerous scale, and the individuals have not been paired. In this case, a chi-square test is appropriate since we like to analyze the relationship between two variables on numinal scale. In our last example, we like to analyze if there is a relationship between systolic blood pressure and body mass index, which both have a continuous scale. In this case, we could test if there is a relationship between the two variables by using the Pearson correlation if we fulfill its assumptions or the Spearman correlation if we do not fulfill the assumptions. Note that the selection between the tests is based on my own view. Depending on who you ask, you might get different answers, especially when it comes to the selection between parametric and non-parametric tests. Also, note that, for example, a simple linear regression model can be used instead of an unpaired t-test if the independent variable has a numerical scale with two groups. The two tests will result in the exact same p-value. In addition, there are a lot more statistical tests to select from. This guide only includes the basic tests. Today, a lot of different types of regression models become more and more popular because they can be used to control for external factors. This was the end of this lecture about how to select between the basic statistical tests. Thanks for watching.